my name is Aaron. I know I introduced myself a little bit earlier. I know a lot of faces here, but in case you're new, um, I am a volunteer here, and normally in this place would be Chris Woolard, our pastor. Um, he planned to be at CCYC, uh, which is a Christian youth conference uh, where we gather teens around the whole state, uh, even from Virginia and South Carolina. There's almost 2,000 students in a room right now, much larger than this space, uh, hearing from a great speaker, great band and everything, and just being connected with what the Lord's doing. Um, but the reason I'm here is actually because uh, Philip, who was supposed to be going, got sick. So Patrick, who was speaking, is now filling in for Phil, who... Patrick was filling in for Chris, and now I'm filling in for Patrick, who's filling in for Phil, who's filling in for Chris. So um, all you need to know is I'm filling in for Chris this morning, basically. So it's good. Oh, thank you, man. That's, that's great. I found it on Thursday, and uh, it's good. No, it's great. I'm really, really glad to be here with you guys. Um, I think what the Lord has for us this morning um, is going to guide us to hopefully put a nice bow on the end of this sermon series that we've been in called Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Um, as you've heard, if you've been here throughout the weeks, is hurry is one of the biggest things that is going against the grain of the Christian life cycle, of, of the way that Jesus lived, the American culture of just getting to the next thing and just hustling and trying to grind and, and push more and be more efficient. It's not really the way that Jesus designed our lives to live. So um, hopefully uh, we can, we can kind of wrap things up, but before we get started with all that, I'd love to do a quick little recap um, to hopefully kind of spur our brains if you've been here. Again, hopefully this will be a good reminder, a good shock of like, oh yeah, that's what we talked about. And if you haven't, then hopefully this will be a good synopsis of, I definitely encourage you to go back and listen to those weeks because Chris did an incredible job of just um, explaining the different processes of how Jesus lived his life as counterintuitive to our natural selves. Um, so, so far we have looked at four practices, four practices that John Mark uh, went through in the book. If you haven't read the book, definitely encourage you to read that. Of course, it's always better to read than just to listen to me. Um, so hopefully um, we can go through these pretty quickly. The first one, they all start with an S, so they're easy to remember. The first one is called Sabbath. Everybody say Sabbath. Sabbath, good. So Sabbath, uh, it's just short to remember with Sabbath. If you don't know what it means, just think of stop. For one day out of the week, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop everything. I'm going to stop producing. I'm going to stop working. I'm going to stop grinding. I'm going to stop trying to get more. I'm going to stop trying to buy more. I'm going to stop trying to do more. I'm just going to stop. And it's not just about stop, and Chris went into great, excellent detail with this, but Sabbath is a big portion that we set aside as a holy day to the Lord. So first, if you remember anything, if you're not a Christian, just good practice, stop one day a week. If you are a Christian, the challenge is, is to worship. Because when we have a void of normally when we're doing something every single day of the week and we're constantly going and constantly grinding, if we stop, our brains are going to want to fill that space with something. So God says, give that to me, Sabbath, let's worship. Um, in the book of Genesis, where we kind of get that principle, um, as God rested on the seventh day, if you know the story of, of creation, um, on, on the seventh day, God rested. And I heard in a podcast one time that, you know, God has many different names, Jehovah, Yahweh. There's many throughout the Old Testament that we call God, but one of the Hebrew words is called El Shaddai. And El Shaddai means the God who knows when to say enough. It's a beautiful way of thinking of the Lord because in six days he's working, he's making things happen we couldn't even imagine seeing of splitting the heavens and the earth, splitting the waters from land, doing all those incredible things. But then on the seventh day, God said, that's enough. I don't need to do anymore. I don't need to fix anymore. I don't need to produce anymore. That's enough. So it's a practice, hopefully you've been implementing in your lives, hopefully from uh, that sermon series until now. Um, anybody actually like Sabbath even this past week? Nice. <laughs> yes, that's a good. Um, yeah, so hopefully, if, if not, I encourage you guys to really dig deep into it. It's something I'm not very structured on. I try my best. As maybe it's a lot of you guys are like, I'm trying to stop. Um, from Saturday night to Sunday night is kind of the 
the time frame that I felt. Um, but we don't do any dishes. We try not to cook. It just literally, there's so many times where you walk through the house and you're like, I'm just going to pick up this trash and get all these toys. And your, your body's just constantly thinking of doing something. And it's just good to just turn it off. A good quote um, from the week when we talked about Sabbath, uh, John Mark Comer said this. He wrote this in the book. It's an incredible quote. He says this. How could a day be called holy? This would have been jarring to the original audience in the ancient Near East. The gods were found in the world of space, in in a place. That's where the gods were found, not of time. They were found in a holy temple or in a holy mountain or a holy shrine. But this God, El Shaddai, our God we serve, this God, the one true creator God, is not found in a place, but in a day. If you want to go meet with this God, you don't have to make a pilgrimage to Mecca or Varanasi or the Stonehenge. You just have to set aside a day of the week to Shabbat. Listen, stop long enough to experience him. In this ruthless elimination of hurry, so many times we go so fast, we don't stop long enough to say, wow, God, you you actually are answering my prayers. God, you actually are with me. I've just been too busy to see the things that you're doing and I'm complaining that I can't see you and it's my own fault. And so it's just a, a good good synopsis of, of that week in Sabbath. One thing I do want to note as we go through all these practices, if you're like me, you're like, that's great. Um, that's a big ask. One whole day. You own a business, large family, whatever you got going on in the week. To give one day up instantly is like, that's a lot. Um, there's a... a I guess a practice that's becoming more popular now, but it's called atomic habits or micro habits. Um, but a lot of times, even, you can hear it with like New Year's resolutions and things, you set the bar so high from where you are and you eventually just collapse because you just can't keep up. It's such a big change of process. And so there's this thing called micro habits. Micro habits. And um, it's going to sound very silly, but here's a very practical thing. Um, I want to floss my teeth every night. My wife's really good at it. She judges me for it that I don't do it. I'm just kidding. She's not judging me. She's really good about her teeth. I'm very proud of her. Um, but I want to floss my teeth every night. So the goal is I'm just going to floss every single night. What a micro habit would say is you floss one tooth every night. Silly. I know. That doesn't accomplish the goal. You're supposed to floss all the teeth every night so I can make my dentist happy and stop feeling sad when I go give a teeth clean. But the thing is, is that when you, again, it's very silly. When you set the bar so high of what you're not normally do, I mean, just brushing your teeth is a good step. I don't do that all the time. Um, but, um, but yeah, starting small, even smaller. It's like, oh, no, I'm starting small. I just floss my teeth every night. And you're like, no, smaller. One tooth a night. And then you bump it up and, and go from there. So anyways, as we go through these practices, remember micro habits. And if it's too large at first, try to condense it to something that's palpable. So um, the second word is this. Simplicity. First word is Sabbath. Second week, we talked about simplicity or to simplify. So Chris had some, asked some really probing questions. I really got to me. I don't know if it got to you guys, but he asked questions like this. How much stuff do you have? And even right now, as I ask that, just think for a second. How much stuff do you have? Walk in the front door of your house in your mind Turn to the left, turn to the right, go down the hallway, go in the different rooms, go in your garage, go in your attic, go in your storage shed, go in your second storage shed, go in your storage units that you're paying monthly for. You know, we continue to just get more and more stuff. And then the second question is, how much of that stuff do you really need? A really good way he posed it was, is if you had to move tomorrow, literally tomorrow, Bags are packing. You're moving to California. That would be awful. Um, You're moving to California. What are you going to take with you? The necessities. You're not going to take all this mess with you. You're going to take exactly what you need to travel across the country. Man, that's uh, that's not sound fun. Um, He has some really good verses that he talked about in that week, talking about simplifying and really Jesus being an expert in the situation, you know, being part of the creation of the whole universe. Uh, he says things like this in Luke 12, 15. Watch out. That's Jesus with an exclamation point. It's not a period after that. Watch out. 
Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And you look at America, you look at what's going on in the media and our culture, and it's just about more. It's about consuming more. And there's nothing wrong with having stuff. It's the hurry of keeping up with it and misaligning with the path that Jesus has for our life. Uh, There's another great verse that uh, Chris shared that week. Um, It says this in uh, Matthew, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy. They cannot destroy, where thieves do not break in and cannot break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is will be also. So the truth is, in life, we're, we're worshiping something or someone. That's really where this, this principle is built out of. It is about possessions and things, but that tagline at the end, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, the reason we simplify is there's so many things competing for your attention, for your affection. And we're all worshiping something or someone, and if it's not God, our foundation will crumble. So Jesus says, look, make me your treasure. Make me your treasure. Um, There's another kind of like side thing in that week. Chris didn't talk about it, but um, anybody ever heard of the minimalists? Yeah, really, really great group. Not, I don't know if they're Christians or not. They're just good principles. But anyways, they're all about, uh, all a part of this movement called minimalism. Um, And it's really that this simple thing of simplifying your life, removing the clutter out of your life. And it's just a resource. If you haven't seen it, there's a documentary on Netflix. Really great thing if you're kind of struggling with stuff. Um, Check that out. Or Marie Kondo. I know that's like weird, but uh, she's awesome. She's all about uh, tidying your house and organizing and things like that. Another thing Kara is really good at, my wife. Uh, Thank you. Um, So first was stop or Sabbath. We had simplify, and then the third week, anybody know the word? Third week? Slowing, good job. Practice of slowing. Slowing. There was this really great quote from the book that I feel like I'm gonna take with me for like the rest of my life. John Mark said this. He said, love and hurry are incompatible. I'm going to say that again. Love and hurry are incompatible. They don't meet. And the most practical thing I can think of, and maybe you can be here too or you have been here, is the morning you're getting ready. You got to get your kids ready. You got to pack their lunch. You got to pack your lunch. You got to get ready for the day, find the clothes, get the diaper bag, get in the car with all the snacks, all the things, and get going. And my one and a half year old son is just like, Dad, up, up, up. They're like, buddy, I just, I don't have time. I've, I've got to go. I've got to, I've got to just, we, we have to get out the door. I'm going to be late and all these things in it. And it just keeps going from there. Then we're hurrying to the next thing and hurrying to the next thing. And though, you know, in that moment, maybe I'm not a terrible parent because I had to do things. But if I planned my day and woke up just a little bit earlier and I got ready first before he woke up, even if that was a thing, Um, it's not a thing with him, Um, but, uh, if I could do that and plan my day, then I'd have the capacity. I wouldn't be in a hurry to just love him and spend time with him, even for that 10 or 15 minutes that we're rushing. So Chris had some really good challenges in this week. Very, very practical, very hands-on. You're like, I'm going to do it this week and it's going to be awesome. And it's all about slowing down. The first one he shared was to drive the speed limit. We all laugh because we know all of us don't drive the speed limit. Drive the speed limit, not seven over, not five over, not one over, 45, 55. I'm curious, did anybody do that after that week? Anybody try it? <laughs> Just Joe's like, no. Yeah, okay. Awesome, awesome. So I tried it on my way to Islands. We were like, all right, we need some dinner. We just didn't want to cook as one of those, you know, hey, it's after five. Where do you go? Islands, that's it. Um, so we're on our way. And I was like, all right, I'm going to do it right now. And I just slowed down enough to 45. Everybody's passing me. And I'm like, 
this is awful. <laughs> I hate this. I had to put on cruise control. Isn't that sad? I can't, my foot will not let me go 45. I have to put cruise control on. Uh, that's how wired we are to just keep going faster and faster. Um, another challenge was get in the slower lane. Obviously, if you're going 45, whatever lane you're in is the slow lane because people are passing you. Um, come to a full stop at stop signs. Anybody do that? Always. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I'm, I'm wrong there. <laughs> uh, don't text and drive. Ew, nobody does that. Yeah, that's so unsafe. You know, you've heard the statistics about texting and driving is actually worse than driving while drunk. Isn't that crazy? So just think about that. Next time you're texting, just imagine yourself drunk. And then actually that's a bad idea. Don't do that. <laughs> but for real. Don't do it. Just stop it. It can wait. Press pause. There's so many digital well-being stuff that's so good about uh, removing yourself from all the notifications and everything. This was a good one. Good challenge. Uh, Show up 10 minutes early for all of your appointments in one week. Man, that's that's a challenge. I mean, especially with Wilmington traffic, you could get there five minutes early, 10 minutes early, or 30 minutes late. And you left at the same time. It does not depend on the day. It's just school buses and everything. So um, get in the longest line when you check out the grocery store. You're that one like with the cart, like, oh, what are you doing? Oh, oh, go down here. And then somebody gets in front of you. You're like, oh, dang. Okay. Come down here and you're back and forth. And just, just pick a line and just stay there. Again, practices of slowing and bringing back. Um, here's a good one. Uh, this is the last one of this week and we'll continue to move on. The challenge was, he said, single task. We're all about multitasking and doing more at the same time, but he says single task. John Mark has a quote from the book on this week. He says, multitasking is a sleight of hand for which switching back and forth between a lot of different tasks so I can do them all poorly instead of doing them well. We deceive ourselves into thinking when we can do more at the same time that we're actually getting more done, where in fact... A lot of times you have to come back and do it again because you weren't focused on that one thing. So single task, another great uh, practice there to, um, to do and to not hurry. Um, the fourth final week before this one was silence and solitude. Silence and solitude. Man, we live in a culture that is battling for our attention, battling for us to believe that one product is better than the other, or one service is better than the other. We can't even go pump gas at a gas station without the news talking about what's going on in Russia. And all this stuff is going on. It's just being bombarded with media and propaganda and all those things. And so the practice is, again, to stop hurrying, to stop feeling that weight of, of the world on our shoulders, to practice silence and solitude. Here's a practice of Jesus that Chris shared that week. It's so good. Very, very famous in Mark chapter one. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went off to a solitary place where he prayed. I want to say that again. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, that means that the sun is down and the moon is up. Okay, dark. Jesus got up. He left the house and went to his solitary place where he prayed. John Mark has a really good quote as well from, um, from this week. He says, solitude is more of a state of mind than it is a place. If we possess an inner solitude, we do not fear being alone, for we know that we are not alone. Neither do we fear being with others, for they do not control us. In the midst of noise and confusion and ads and all the things going on, we are settled into a deep inner silence. Whether alone or among people, we always carry with us a portable sanctuary of the heart. I like that little bit at the end, a portable sanctuary of the heart. Do you feel like even when you get somewhere, you're just not there You know, you're going through life and you get to work and your brain is still at home. Your brain is still in the conversation that happened in the car or that morning or the night before. 
And practicing this inner silence and solitude is a way that we can sit and be still with Jesus. To be still and to know that I am God. A very famous passage from the book of Psalms. It's not be hurried and know that I am God. It's not be anxious and know that I am God. It's not get more stuff and know that I am God. It's be still and know that I am God. Another passage that Chris shared that week uh, was from John 15, uh, talking about remaining in Jesus and abiding in Jesus. He says this, Jesus says this, Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. And that makes sense. I can't just plant a grape and it's just going to continue to make more grapes. It's got to be connected to the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. And then Jesus says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. I am the father, you are my children. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. It's not you possibly could bear much fruit if the season's right. It's you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. It's easy to forget that last little part. It's like, oh yeah, in Jesus, I can do a lot. But not in Jesus, we can do nothing. A very, uh, very big portion there of that verse. But um, a lot of great practices, a lot of things to ruthlessly eliminate hurry that we've been studying. And we have one final week and one final word, one final practice um, that hopefully, again, we can just solidify the series. And uh, hopefully you can take this home, uh, spend time with your kids to practice this, live a life like Jesus And the word of this week, the final one, starts with an S, is surrender. Surrender. Surrender is a word or a practice that is not natural to ourselves. Um, When you think of the word surrender, you think of like giving up, (laughs) waving the white flag, we're retreating, we're leaving. Um, Aaron, it sounds a lot like losing. And last I checked, losing is bad. I don't want to lose. I like to win. So I'm not going to surrender. I want to be in control. I want to move forward and push the ball down the field. And, but the thing is, is at the core of Jesus, at the core of his teaching, at the core of how he lived, he himself was even a person of surrender to the Father. And so we're, if we're going to talk about the practices of Jesus, we have to talk about surrender. So think about this. Every practice that we've looked at can all boil down to this one word, surrender. So to live an unhurried life, we have to surrender to Jesus, of course. We can't Sabbath without surrendering that one day. I wanted to do things with that day, but now I'm going to surrender that day to you, Jesus, for your glory and for your purpose. We can't simplify without surrendering our schedule and our stuff. You say, this isn't my schedule anymore. This isn't my stuff anymore. Jesus, I surrender those things to you now. We can't slow down without surrendering our pace of life. If we want to move fast and continue moving forward, Jesus says, no, we're going to slow down. You have to surrender your pace of life. And we certainly can't find silence or solitude if we don't surrender our attention, our emotions, our affection, our busyness. We can't sit in silence and solitude without surrendering those parts of our life to Jesus. That's a big ask. One week, you know, go through all of that and be like, that's how we are supposed to live life. But remember micro habits. Remember, this is the long game. The long game. The wise are upright and they're looking farther down the field. The crooked are bent looking down and will soon destroy them. So for the rest of our time today, we're going to look into some passages and challenges of surrender. So every week, we'd like to take time to look to the Bible for answers to life's most important questions, the way that we can find a lamp into our feet, a light into our path. We use the word to learn by and live by. So if you have your Bibles, um, go ahead and pull them out or your phones, Bible app, all great things. Um, Turn to John chapter 14. Um, We're going to spend a little bit of time in there and a little bit of Matthew. Um, But Jesus is, at this point in his ministry, uh, quite a ways through. He's got a large following, people that are literally following him everywhere. This is not like Instagram where they're digital. They're literally behind him everywhere. He walks in a room, great crowd of people. It's just crazy. I can't even imagine people just following him around all the time. Um, but he has this, this moment where he takes time 
to just give some wisdom to his disciples, to his apostles, to the people following him. And uh, Jesus says this in John chapter 14. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Pause there. You're like, that's great. Uh, You're not living the life that I'm living right now, Jesus. You don't work for the boss that I work for. You know, you don't have the family that I have, you know, that we don't speak of. You don't have the kids I have, Jesus. Like, these kids are crazy. It's like, do not let your hearts be troubled. I love the kindness of Jesus in this phrase. Because it's so good. It sounds too good to be true, but he's inviting us into a beautiful choice. He's giving us permission where we think we have no control over, that our life is just hurried. It's always just going to be troubled because that's where we live. But Jesus says, no, just just don't let it. You have a choice. You have a choice. Don't let your hearts be troubled. He continues on. He says, my father's house has many rooms, talking about heaven. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and I prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you will also be where I am. You know the place where I'm going. And he ends there, and that's it. And then, of course, you know, you're thinking what I'm thinking. You're like, "Uh, what do you mean by that, Jesus? Like, what's going on here? And Thomas actually has the guts to speak up, and he's like, "Uh, Jesus, a quick thought question. Um, So, uh, Lord, we don't know where you're going. I have no clue. What are you talking about? (laughs) What are you talking about, Jesus? How can we know the way? Everybody say the way. The way. The way. How can we know the way? And Jesus answers with a very famous and popular passage. If you were raised in the church, you've heard this often. The great verse. Jesus says this. I am the way. Everybody say the way. The way. I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. How many of you would agree that the way we say something or do something matters? Right? Yes? You think so? So it's not just what you do. It's how you say it, the body language. And body language, in, in fact, it's like a psychologist have studied this, body language is 70 to 80% of communication. So the way you're kind of like slouching and looking back, I mean, you could say something nice, but that posture says, I don't care about you. Or, you know, you're leaning forward and you're engaged and you're talking to someone and you're looking them eye to eye. You could not be saying anything, but you're communicating, I'm interested in this conversation. I'm here for you. There's, there's so many ways we can communicate. So it's not just what we say, but it's how we say it, the way we say and do these things. So if you're a Christian, And you've heard this verse a lot. Oftentimes we read this, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and we land on the truth. Most of the time we talk about the truth of Jesus. What did Jesus say? What did Jesus talk about? What did the apostles talk about? What does the Old Testament say? And there's nothing wrong with that. There's everything good with that. We need to know the truth. The truth will set you free, all good things. But the thing is, is that we need to know the way that Jesus lived in order to really live out these principles. Because if we live the way that Jesus lived, it is a reflection of the truth that Jesus taught within us. We often talk about the truth that Jesus proclaimed, and we often overlook the way that Jesus lived, which is a big portion of why we're in the series to begin with. So I don't know if you know this. This is pretty cool. Um, In the book of Acts, as the early church is uh, taking off and growing rapidly, they weren't called Christians. Do you know what they were called? Anybody know? The way? Yeah, they were called people of the way. They were so devoted to the way Jesus was living, so devoted to the practices of Jesus, not just what he said, but how he lived his life. Being followers of him forever, you can imagine that it's so much easier to follow Jesus when you're actually walking beside him every single step of the way. But this is a very interesting thing that that's even what they were called early on, people of the way. And they surrendered their life to the way of Jesus. I love that. 
Uh, I don't know about you guys, um, but I really, I know this is going to sound very funny, but I love Google. Um, a lot of people are like anti-Google. You don't like it, like most powerful search engine and, you know, they're going to take over the universe and all those things. Probably so. Um, but I think uh, they put out a lot of great things. One of my favorite things that Google has put out is Google Photos. Anybody use Google Photos? No? Yeah? One person. All right, sweet. <laughs> I love Google Photos. It tracks the history of all your photos stored in one place. But the fun thing is, is that every once in a while, they just send you little collages of pictures. They're just like, boom, here's where you were five years ago with all your friends doing that thing. Or like, if you're like me, it's like, boom, here's the unit you were working on five years ago. And different things from work and all that. And I found myself sometimes, um, especially a couple weeks ago, I got this rabbit trail of just looking at um, these collages and pictures. And I got some up here I'd like to show you guys, some fun ones, uh, me and my bride, Kara, at a wedding. And uh, yeah, just some goofy, fun faces of this guy, whoever he is. Um, And then the last one here, just another one to kind of recap. Um, Just years back, you know, this is seven, eight years, um, me and, and Kara and playing shows and things like that. And you may not notice this when you look at it. But when I notice, uh, when I look at things in this picture, I notice a guy who was lighter. Not weight wise. I mean, I'm talking about like the smile was different. The the goofiness was there. He was lighthearted. He was joyful. He was just sporadic. He had time. He wasn't busy. He didn't care about careers and 401ks and Roth IRAs. He didn't care about raising your kids to be the best kids and take over the universe. You know, this guy was just a guy and he just loved being around people. He loved hanging out with people. He loved playing board games. He loved spending time with family and friends. And if you're like me, you look back 10 years ago, 15, 20 years, you pull up Google Photos, look at some collages. You're like, man, when did I get so serious? (laughs) I used to be fun. (laughs) I used to make people laugh. I used to just, I don't know. There's just these things where you go back and you're like, man, when did this change? And it's not just a moment. You can't look back at an event and be like, that's when it changed and everything was serious from then on. We're going uphill. We're taking over the world. You know, it's it's slowly over time. There's a little bit more hurry, a little bit more weight, a little more priorities, a little more respect, a little more responsibility, a little more, a little more, a little more. And then you just look and be like, man, what is all this for? What is all this for? If you are feeling exhausted, if you are feeling weighed down, if you're feeling heavy burdened, throughout the series, we've had a lot of moments and practices to slow you down, to release to Jesus. And Jesus is inviting you into a wonderful invitation that we're going to share right now. The very famous passage again would be in the book of Matthew. Jesus says this, Come to me, All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. There's something weird here if you don't know what it is. He says, take my yoke upon you, whatever the heck that is, um, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It says, take my yoke. If you've heard this, uh, uh, this passage before or heard it spoken in church, you may have been taught this, but just in case, if not, a yoke is a tool that is used for, for plowing or for pooling. You would, you would cook two cattle together and I have a picture right here of a yoke. You put two animals together so they pull in unison and they pull together. And then after looking at that, you're like, why the heck would I want that, Jesus? <laughs> I am exhausted. The last thing I want to do is put that on my shoulders. I want to lay on the couch. I want to watch TV. I want an Epsom salt bath. I want my feet rubbed, you know. That's what I want to do when I'm exhausted. Why would I want to put 
that on. And these early uh, people in the early church in the first century, I mean, they know exactly what they're talking about. They know the use of that tool. They also understand this, that everyone has a yoke on them and they're joined to something. Remember what I was talking about with worship. We're always worshiping, worshiping something or someone. It's just a matter of who. We're always, always giving value to something better than ourselves. Maybe it is ourselves, but we're always adding value to something else. So the truth is, is that we're always yoked to something. And so now if you take that mental picture of, I have a yoke on, it doesn't matter of, am I exhausted or not? I have it on. And Jesus is saying, look, let me join with you. Let me be in yoke with you. Let me pull with you and I will bring you rest. It's a really nice word picture and and picture there that really helps put this um, verse into practice and help really think through the practicalities of that throughout our entire week. And uh, you may push back on that and you're like, yeah, Aaron, that's that's nice uh, just to be yoked with Jesus, but you're not a single mom working two jobs. Yeah, I'm not. (laughs) Aaron, yeah, that's nice to be yoked to Jesus, but you don't have the student loan debt that I have and the car payments and the credit card payments. We have the mortgage. Like, you're right. (laughs) Aaron, that's nice, but you don't have the kids that I have, man. They're a mess. They're just taking everything to try to provide for them and do all these things for them. And I'm, yeah, you're right. But there's no qualifier before that if you have life going on, then you get yoked with Jesus. The qualifier is if you are weary, if you're tired, take my yoke upon you for my burden is easy and light. Jesus had a pretty big assignment. (laughs) He wasn't a single mom with two jobs. Uh, He didn't have student loan debt, credit card debt. Um, But he did have a pretty big assignment, you know. Uh, be perfect, save the world, (laughs) be present to everyone and show them the way to the Father. That's a pretty big assignment, but yet Jesus took the time to surrender to the Father and say, not my will, Lord, but your will be done. Jesus had the time and his pace throughout life to slow down and be with the people that he passed by. Another beautiful picture of this yoke um, is that, especially when it relates to hurry, is that it won't allow us to speed ahead. If truly we're yoked with Jesus, he's our rock of our salvation. You can't pull past Jesus. You can't pull him away from what he's doing in his mission. If you're yoked with Jesus, you are going to be in line. You're going to fall in with Jesus in this moment here. And the other beautiful thing is, this is one I struggle with. If I'm not pushing forward, I'm going to fall behind. If I'm not going and grinding, I'm I'm not gaining. So another good thing about this yoke, when you're in line with Jesus, you're abiding with him, you remain in him, you're not going to fall behind because the pace of Jesus is perfect. It's set in stone. It's the way we should live our lives. One last passage I like to share, and then we'll kind of wrap up in this time of surrender. Um, if you're a Christian or not a Christian yet, the bar is pretty high to be a disciple of Jesus. Uh, to surrender is something we don't like doing. Again, it's like losing. I don't want to lose. I, I want what I want. But the way of Jesus is the way of, of the future, of life with God, of, of perfection, of um, the way we should live on, on this earth And Jesus says this to his disciples. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? At some point in life, You may get to the point that I got a couple weeks ago and I'm still continuing to be in where I draw a line in the sand and I say, no more. No more. I'm not going to hurry any more. 
I'm not going to care about the things of this world anymore. I'm tired of being in debt. I'm tired of struggling to get ahead. I'm tired of trying to make all these things happen for our life. I'm tired of trying to appease everyone. I'm tired of carrying the weight of all these things going on. You say, no, I'm done. I'm not going to hurry anymore. I'm going to slow down. I'm going to be still. I'm going to be patient. And I'm going to trust that the Lord is God. Because truly... What can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Or what good would it be for you to gain the whole world, yet forfeit your soul? So finally, I just, I encourage you guys, encouraging myself here in this moment as well, to surrender. We have the the four words, the practices of the book, Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And the final one is surrender. If we practice a practice of surrendering to Jesus. He promises patience. He promises kindness. He promises stillness. He promises rest from our weary souls. I'd love to pray for us this morning.